Okay. So guys, today, actually, you know what? There we go. That's what we're actually doing. So guys, today what we're going to do is we are going to go over some new material about dilutions. And then we're going to review ever so briefly titrations. I'll be back in a second. So guys, what on earth do these two things have in common? And the answer is that they both tie back to solution concentrations. So when we talk about dilution, we're talking about taking a concentrated solution and making it less concentrated. Then how do we do titrations? Well, titration is the process of figuring out the concentration of one solution by comparing it with something we don't know or that we do know the concentration of. So guys, the big overarching concept in today is solution concentration. Now, what are our units for solution concentration? Molarity. So guys, let's talk about it. This is molarity. Molarity, oh, you know what I'm realizing? I didn't switch. There we go. Guys, this is our unit of solution concentration. It is molarity. It is a ratio. It is the ratio of moles of solute. And guys, if you don't remember what solute is, if you want a simple example, that would be the salt. And then the liters of solution would be the total mixture, the total, the total system. So if you're thinking about salt solutions, the solute is the salt. But then you'll notice, guys, that it's not liters of solvent, it's liters of solution. And that'll become more, but this is review. You'll, you'll get into this more as we go. Does that, do we need to say more? Do you remember this? You're okay with molarity? Okay. So guys, this then is where we're going to dig into this in a little greater depth than we have before. What you're going to find out is when we talk about solution concentrations, there's actually a couple different ways that we can deal with this. So guys, when we express concentrations, we can do this in one of two ways. One of the things that we can do, and this is the one that you're accustomed to, and this is the one that you're used to seeing on all the bottles that you've grabbed in your life, is we just talk about the concentration of the solute. And guys, up until now, this is all we've been able to really talk about. You're going to find out that there's another way to think about this that is now within the scope of possibility for you because you understand weak and strong electrolytes. So let me give you some simple examples that will feel familiar that we will then expand on when I show you the other way to do concentrations. So imagine that you get a bottle that is one molar sodium chloride. Well, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you the concentration of sodium chloride. If you have a liter of that solution, you know that there's one mole of NaCl in there. The formula mass of NaCl is 58.5 grams per mole. So to make it, you put 58.5 grams of salt in a one liter flask. You fill it up to a liter, let it dissolve. There's your one molar solution. Is that all coming back to you? Okay, so let me give you a different one. Calcium chloride. How do you make a one molar calcium chloride solution? Well, you simply take one mole of calcium chloride. How much is that? Well, it's actually 111 grams because chlorine is 35.5, double it, add 40. So you get 111 grams of calcium chloride, put it in a flask, fill it up to a liter, let it dissolve, boom, there's your solution. So guys, you're comfortable with the idea of molarity, right? Okay, but now guys, let's draw some pictures. Are you guys all coming to really appreciate the kind of artist I am? I know, right? So. Let's take a look. So guys, draw me a beaker right over here and draw me what is in a beaker of one molar NaCl. And then get yourself a second beaker and draw what is in a beaker of one molar CaCl2. 
what's in there? Do them both. Did you get them? So guys, let's talk about the sodium chloride solution first. And then I'm going to share with you sort of my convicting experience about 18 months ago when I was up at the University of Utah. So guys, let's do the NaCl solution first. So guys, first question is this, how much NaCl is in an NaCl solution? None. There is no NaCl in an NaCl solution. So guys, when you form an NaCl solution, what is actually in that beaker of salt water? Sodium ions and chloride ions. There is no NaCl. Of course, there's water molecules surrounding those. You can sort of picture that in your brain. But guys, this was my convicting moment when I was up at the University of Utah. See, the University of Utah twice a year flies in noted chemistry educators from around the world, literally, flies these people in and invites all the AP teachers in the state to come and learn from them as they're sharing things that they're learning in, in chemistry. A lot of times these are just hyper bright people that are teaching stuff, that researching stuff that never has anything to do with this class. It's just fascinating. But guys, 18 months ago, they flew in this guy from the University of Melbourne in Australia. And this guy actually has several PhDs in chemistry education, which guys is very unusual for university people to care more about teaching science than doing science. But this is what this guy does. And he gets up here on the board and he writes down just what we did and he writes down one molar NaCl and then he draws a beaker and then he has a whole room full of AP chemistry teachers draw a one molar NaCl solution and of course we're all bright teachers so we all write down this and then he got in front of everybody in front of the room and remember he's from Australia so the limits in terms of acceptable language are a little bit different there and apparently damn is not understood to be a cuss word in Australia and he gets up in front of us and he says guys do you understand that as a chemistry teacher if you get up in front of a class of high schoolers and if you write down this most high schoolers do not read this and think this, and that makes you a damn liar. And I went, oh my gosh, I've been teaching this for 22 years, and I wonder how many students wandered out of my classroom seeing one molar NaCl and actually thinking that a solution of NaCl contains NaCl. And then he said it gets even worse because then what you do is you put a Q on the tail of it, and when you do that, you then tell all of your students that this exists, and there's actually a sodium chloride solution. And that's impossible. There's no such thing as a sodium chloride solution. So guys, tell me that you understand the difference. Do you understand that there's no such thing as a sodium chloride solution? Do you get it? Why is there no such thing as a sodium chloride solution? What does it do when it goes into water? It breaks apart. How much sodium chloride is in a sodium chloride solution? None. And so, guys, what this guy from Australia was suggesting is that right from the very start, we should be writing this instead because that is actually what exists in solution. Do you get the idea? Okay, guys, make sure that you're really comfortable with that. There is no such thing as a sodium chloride solution. It's sodium and it's chloride. So you ready for the weird sort of extension of this? You've never tasted salt. Think about that. You've never tasted salt. You have no idea what salt tastes like. Why not? 
You put salt on your finger, you put it in your tongue. What happens to it? It dissolves in your spit. You have no idea what sodium chloride tastes like. You know what sodium ion and chloride ion taste like because nobody has ever tasted salt because the entire process of tasting involves putting it on your tongue. And even if you were to pull out your tongue and dry it off with a towel, if you then put it on your tongue, your tongue couldn't taste it because it requires dissolving before you can even taste it in the first place. And you've never tasted salt. You've tasted sodium and chloride ion, but it's impossible to taste salt. Isn't that weird? Isn't that crazy? But that's the take home message. Okay, so now if we back this truck up, and we go here. So you guys are comfortable with sodium chloride, right? Now do calcium chloride. What's in a calcium chloride solution? Or maybe you already did it. Did you already do it? So what's in it? Calcium, two plus, and Cl minus. What's wrong with that? So when this breaks apart, what do the chlorides do? They separate. Guys, it is not Cl2. By the way, what is Cl2? It's a gas. And this is not a gas. This is individual chloride ions. So now, guys, let's go backwards and answer this. These are both one molar solutions, right? One molar NaCl, one molar CaCl2. Here's an interesting question. Which one's more concentrated? Wait, they're both one molar, but which one's more concentrated? Why the CaCl2? Because it's got three particles in there. See, guys, the other way that we can think about concentration is we can think about the concentration of particles. And when we think about the concentration of particles, we now understand that the calcium chloride, uh oh, even though it's one molar, the calcium chloride solution is actually more concentrated because every CaCl2 that goes in there breaks into one calcium and two chlorides. So the calcium chloride solution is actually more concentrated. And guys, you can see that if you look at it this way. So the NaCl solution will be one molar in Na and one molar in Cl minus. The calcium chloride solution is one molar in calcium ion, but it's two molar in chloride ion. And so in total, this is actually two molar, whereas this is three molar. Now guys, that has a name, and I'm gonna give this to you right now, and we'll talk about it more in a couple months, but this is what is called the Van't Hoff factor. So guys, the Van't Hoff factor is a number that represents the number of particles a substance breaks into when it dissolves. Do you need me to say that again? It represents the number of particles that a substance breaks into when it dissolves. I can try. So the number of particles a substance breaks into when it dissolves. So particles breaks into when dissolved. That's all you need, right? I mean, those are your notes. If you read particle breaks and dissolved, you can fill in the gaps, yeah? Oh, sure, take my next question. Let's do it. C6H12O6, one of the sugars. When sugar goes into water, how many particles does it break into? 
It doesn't break apart, right? And that's exactly the point. The Van Hoff factor for the sugars is one. So if you have a one molar sugar solution, that is also one molar in particles. Yeah, so let's generalize that because sugars are what kind of substance when we think about solubility? Weak, strong, non or non-soluble. They are the non-electrolytes. So guys, what is the Van Hoff factor for all non-electrolytes? One. You may want to scratch that down. The Van Hoff factor for all non-electrolytes is one because as Matt insightfully figured out, they don't break into smaller particles. They just dissolve in chunks. And so for every one that goes in, one particle is formed. So the Van Hoff factor for all non-electrolytes is one. You okay with the idea? All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Ah, oh, okay. Let's do it. So C O ah, ah, ooh. Undo, undo. Where are we at? Here we go. Boom, 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 boom. You know what? All right, we'll do this. Okay. So for 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 weak electrolytes. Why? No, that wasn't my fault. The first one was. Okay. So C H three C O O H. Weak electrolyte, so acetic acid, right? Does acetic acid break apart when it dissolves? Does it ionize? Partially, right? So let's say that we have a one molar solution of acetic acid. So what's in there? Well, do we have any unprotonated acetic acid? You bet. Do we have any acetate ion? Absolutely. Do we have any protons? Absolutely. So now let's talk about how many. So, if, and again, we're starting at one molar. So what would the concentration of unprotonated acetic acid be? Not an exact, but where should it be? A large amount, but not larger than what? Not larger than one, right? So this will be slightly smaller than one molar, right? So now, how much uh, protonated acetate ion do we have? Just a little bit, right? So this is going to be somewhere slightly bigger than zero, but it's going to be very small. And that's the point, is that this will be the same. These two will be equal right? So what then would be the molarity of the solution? Well, we know that it's going to be more than one molar because one molar would mean it doesn't break apart at all. But if it all broke apart, then this would be zero and these would each be one for a total of two. So the Van Hoff factor for this has to lie somewhere between I don't know why it's doing that. So the Van Hoff factor for this has to lie somewhere between one and two, but it will be shifted more towards the one because it doesn't break up extensively. Not until March. We can figure it out in March. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh-huh. So if we had a beaker full of sugar, all you of sugar water, all you would see in there is sugar molecules dissolved in water. There wouldn't be any ions, there wouldn't be any smaller particles. It would just be intact sugar molecules. Because this is a strong electrolyte. When so, when 
when sodium chloride dissolves in water, you do not have any sodium chloride in water. It breaks apart and you get sodiums and chlorides. When sugar dissolves in water, it does not break apart and you just get sugar. Is that okay? Okay. So guys, let's continue on. So, and I'm not going to get into this with you. Feel free to go back and review your stuff from general chemistry. But molarity can also be a conversion factor for us. You may remember problems that said something like, how many sodium atoms are in 300 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium chloride? So the question was, how many... Uh, Sorry, that one was my fault. So the question was something like, how many sodium atoms, so how many sodium atoms are in 300 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide? So we'd go 1,000 milliliters is one liter, and then one liter, we've got to get to moles. But the molarity is the conversion, so if it's a 0.1 molar solution, that means there's 0.1 moles of sodium hydroxide in it, and then you just go from there. So guys, understand that molarity, and I know that that was really fast, I wasn't intending to teach you anything, just refresh at least the experience in your brain. Guys, molarity can also be a conversion factor for us if we need to convert between volume and moles or moles and volume, because molarity is the relationship between moles and liters. Okay, so you'll find homework questions on that. Dig into them. If you need more help, be sure to ask questions. Okay, so this then is the new stuff. Dilutions. These are interesting. So guys, it goes like this. Maybe I should say this first. You, you are going to see one of these on the AP test. They love, and it may not be exactly like this, but there will be a laboratory question on the AP test. Now, what that requires is that you write out steps and procedures. And sometimes the first step of that lab process is for you to explain how you would make a solution. So this is the idea, and this is about dilutions. Now guys, most of the time, the substances that we routinely use in lab, we actually buy as concentrates and then we dilute them in order to use them. Remember, for those of you that are in the lab, you may remember that I showed you the 12 molar salt or hydrochloric acid bottle, the 14.1 molar nitric acid bottle, and then the 18 molar sulfuric acid bottle. Guys, the thought here being that when I buy acids, especially, we buy them as concentrates. They're amazingly expensive to ship, so it makes a whole lot more sense to order the stuff at 18 molar and then dilute it than it does to order like 0.01 molar sulfuric acid get a bottle of that and just have to have them keep shipping me bottles because I need a lot of it. It's easier to buy this stuff as a concentrate, ship it once, and then I dilute it into the amounts that we need. And guys, this stuff lasts forever. Like I've had the same bottle of sulfuric acid for the last decade and it's not even half gone. This stuff, because we buy it in such high concentrations and because we use it in such low concentrations, it's just a really effective way to take care of this. Now guys, what they're going to do is they're going to expect that you can actually figure out how to make dilute solutions from concentrates. So guys, this is the way to do it. You wanna scratch this down. So this is what is called the dilution equation. This is not on the AP equation sheet, but they expect you to know it. And guys, frankly, I would suggest that this is completely reasonable because it's a simple ratio. You can actually figure this out doing dimensional analysis if you ever get really stuck. But guys, this works really well for doing what we need to do. So let me show you how it works. And we're gonna do this together. So it reads like this. It says, stock sulfuric acid comes as an 18 molar solution. 
Say that in lab, we need a 0.1 molar solution. And for the lab, we need 250 milliliters of that solution. How would you make the solution? And guys, we're gonna go through this together. We're gonna do the math. We're gonna write out the steps. And we're gonna talk about some general principles for how to communicate to the AP graders that you know how to work in lab. Some of this is going to become a little funny and tongue in cheek, but it's what they expect and we're gonna to learn to play their game. So you guys ready to go? You understand the question? I should have brought the 18 molar sulfuric acid bottle in here, but guys understand it scares me to death and so I'm not gonna bring it in here because it's just not worth it. You guys ready to go? Okay, so guys, this is the way that, oh gosh, so this is the way this goes. In order to solve this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to write down this equation. And the equation goes like this. It says molarity and then little i. And what does the little i stand for? Initial times the volume initial is equal to the molarity final and the volume final. Now, guys, the way that this works is our stock solution is where we start. So the 18 molar sulfuric acid is our initial solution, and we want to know the, the final volume, the final solution. So guys, it goes like this. What is the initial molarity of our stuff? 18 molar. Now the question is this, how much, what volume? how much 18 molar solution do we need to make our dilute solution? That makes this our X. Now, what is the molarity that we finally want? 0 0.100 molar, and then our final volume is 250 milliliters. So then, guys, all we got to do is the math. Just like that. So two significant digits, 1.4 milliliters. Are you beginning to understand why it is that that bottle of sulfuric acid has lasted me a decade? So guys, think about this in context. 0 0.1, 0.1 molar sulfuric acid, if you get it on you, is like lights out, you're done. This stuff is spooky. But guys, all I need is 1.4 milliliters of my stock solution. And do you remember the bottle? It's a two and a half liter bottle. There's 2,500 milliliters inside that bottle. And I only need 1.4 milliliters to make enough pretty darn concentrated acid for an entire class. That's why it lasts forever. But understand this, guys. We're nowhere near done answering this question. We did math, and math is not the answer. Do you understand what the math means, though? Now let's talk about how to answer the question. Because the question says, how would you make this solution? And guys, this requires that you write a lab procedure. You'll notice that I wrote to the left so that I have room to the right, and I'm going to write this down with you. Guys, commit this to your notes because this is what is expected every single time. You ready? Step number one, put on goggles, gloves. I can't even spell apron. Is it two A's? AP? We don't even have gloves and aprons. But guys, the AP graders require that any time you write up a lab procedure, your first step is put on goggles, gloves, and aprons. No matter what. No matter what. So you will, on the AP test, be writing lab procedures. Step number one is goggles, gloves, and apron. Write it down every time. So it even, you can't even specialize safety. Nope. They expect you to write it out. Okay. 
Now guys, let's talk about this. How are we going to make this solution? Well, we know that it's going to require 1.4 milliliters of this concentrated acid. Now guys, what are we going to do with that 1.4 milliliters of acid? <laughs> And yes, but no, and if don't write that down. You understand that technically that's what we're gonna do, right? We are eventually going to dilute this to 250 milliliters. But guys, it's impossible to measure out 248.6 milliliters of water. That's not how you do it. But guys, don't make this mistake. Why is it also wrong to take that 1.4 milliliters of acid and add it to 250 milliliters of water? It can be more than 250 milliliters. So how do we dilute this acid right up to 250 milliliters? Go ahead. Do you like have a solution a little bit less? Yes. Than 250 when you put the 1.4 Uh-huh. And that's the trick. So guys, and there are important things along the way that you need to come to understand. So let me share the most important one of these with you first. So guys, the dilutions that you are going to be doing, and you'll do this in lab, take place in these. These are what are called volumetric flasks. These are crazy expensive. This is like a $40 flask. The reason why, guys, is because each one of these has to be individually calibrated. Remember, we've been talking about this in lab, and guys, calibration assures accuracy. So which one is, is more accurate to measure, mass or volume? Mass, so guess what they do? They cast this, uh, this uh, volumetric flask, and then what they do, and actually this isn't a 250, it's a 500, so let's just call it what it is. But then what they do is they calibrate this flask, and this is what makes it so expensive. Instead of filling this with 500 milliliters of water and figuring out where that is, what they do is they calculate what mass of water would have a volume of 500 milliliters, and they actually put this on a balance, hit re-zero, then they fill it up with enough water water that they know that they've added 500 milliliters, not based upon volume, but based upon mass. Does that make sense? Then what they do is they actually laser etch this glass neck with one line. And guys, I don't know if you can see that or not, but there's a line right there. And that line is in a different place for every single 500 milliliter volumetric flask. Some of them are down here, meaning the bulb's a little bigger. Some of them are up here, meaning the bulb's a little smaller. And that's all that this flask can do is measure 500 milliliters, but it measures it perfectly. Well, within the reasonable accuracy. But guys, these are very, expensive because each one is custom calibrated. Now, here's the trick then, guys. You ready? Eventually, and pretend this is a 250 now, but eventually the idea is in here we're going to be mixing acid and water, right? We're going to be diluting 18 molar acid. So let's talk about this principle. Do you add acid to water or water to acid? And guys, the answer is you always add acid to water. And here's why. Imagine that if you put some acid inside this flask and then you dumped water into it. Well, guys, what happens when the acid and the water get together? Well, they react. And remember, it forms hydronium ion, all of that stuff. But guys, this reaction is very, very exothermic. It is so exothermic that when you dilute 18 molar sulfuric acid, it can boil. It's terrifying. So when I, like, there's a lab that we're going to do where we actually need like 10 molar sulfuric acid. So I'm not diluting it very much. And it seriously scares the pants off of me because when I mix these two together, there's so much acid that this gets so hot that it can start to boil. So here's the deal. Why do we add acid to water and not water to acid? Well, guys, imagine that there's a bunch of acid in the bottom of this and we pour water into it. If this starts to boil, what's going to come out of the top? 
most of it's going to be acid, right? Because if there's a lot of acid in here, and if we add water, when it boils over, it's all coming out. And if we start with the acid, it's going to be a lot of acid. Now, what if we have a bunch of water in here, and we start to add the acid, and it starts to boil? Well, most of what's coming out is going to be the water. Do you get the idea? So you always add acid to water. So now let's turn this into a procedure. Step number two is, and I'm going to sort of abbreviate, partially fill 250 milliliter volumetric flask with distilled water. Volumetric is actually spelled the way it sounds. Just volume cut off. Well, actually keep the E. It's volumetric. Volume trick, right. And guys, it's got to be distilled water. Then step number three. What's that? It's just distilled. But yes, that's what distilled water is. Then slowly add 1.4. 1.4 milliliters um, concentrated H2SO4, or you could identify it as 18 molar. It's the same. Maybe we should put 18 molar. Then, guys, step number four. Fill volumetric flask to 250 milliliter line. And you're done. So the goggles, gloves, and apron is an important step. Still water is an important step. Yeah. No, they, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, because if you don't, it could still boil over. Um, but no, they, they won't kill you for slowly. You could just put add. Yeah. Um, should you put the 1.4 milliliters or the 1.4 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, VF is just me running out of space. But guys, do not say graduated cylinders. It's volumetric flasks. How are we doing? You guys okay? You're good? Good? Good. Okay. So guys, last thing we need to do, we're going to go. Let's, let's go. So this last thing we're going to do is we are going to touch briefly on titrations. Tracy, did you titrate last year? You don't even know. Okay, we'll, we'll look. So guys, titrations. Allow me to refresh your memory. Remember that guys, last year you did not actually titrate in lab. Um, we use this as the opportunity to show you how to titrate through virtualization. Um, if you are in the second period lab class, you are going to become such a proficient titrator that you had no idea. We're going to end up doing about nine or ten titrations this year. Are we going to have to like manually count the drops? No, we will, we, we neither. We, oh, did you guys, oh, you guys used drop counters at the U, didn't you? Yeah, no, we will do volume but not count drops. So we'll just read, we'll read volumes off the burette. We will not count drops. Yeah, okay. So guys, the trick with this then is titration is the process of you taking a substance that you know the concentration of. In this case, maybe the sodium hydroxide and figuring out the concentration that you don't know the concentrate, a solution you don't know the concentration of, like let's say HCl, even though we really do know it. And the way that you do this is you put your standard in a burette. Then you put the solution that we're pretending that we don't know the concentration of 
in a beaker, put it on here, and we stir it. And we will have stirring plates for those of you that are in the lab. Then we add phenolphthalein to this, and then we add base to the acid. And as we add base to the acid, the base is reacting with the acid, and it's forming salt water, in this case, literally sodium chloride and water. But you may remember that as we do this, we get to this magic point. I can open up the viewer. Uh -oh. We get to this magic point where we have added equal molar amounts of base and acid. You like that, huh? It is. Can you believe this was last May? Oh, I know. Yeah, and I went too far, but we understand that the indicator changes color, telling us the point at which we've neutralized the acid with the base or the base with the acid. And then this allows us to do calculations to figure out the concentration of the thing we don't know the concentration of. Do you remember how to do the calculations or would it be helpful to go over it? Helpful to go over? Okay. So guys, let's just grab these numbers here really quickly. Please write these down for me. This data is not excellent, but we're going to use it. So the concentration of our standard is 0 0.1104 molar. The volume of our standard is 24.95 milliliters. Did you get it? And then the volume of our unknown was 25 milliliters. On this one? No, because so this is 26. And remember on a burette, it zeroes at the top. So we haven't yet got to 25. Do you see what I'm saying? Because zero's up here and we drain down. So it would be 24.95. Is that okay? Okay. Am I okay? Okay. So guys, you got those three pieces of data, right? So let's hippie skip over here and uh, let's take a shot at this. So what we're trying to figure out is we're trying to figure out the molarity of the acid. We're pretending that we don't know what it is. So how do we do this? Well, guys, the first thing we need to do is write a balanced equation. So our acid was HCl, our base was NaOH. And our products are salt and water. And for this case, complete molecular equations are best, because if we wrote the net ionic equation, we just have H plus OH makes water. Um, and that doesn't really help us. Okay, so now guys, our first calculation. We added, what, 24.95 milliliters of base? What we need to know is how many moles of NaOH was in that volume. So we want to know how many moles of NaOH was in 24.95 milliliters. So what does that math look like? So we're going to go milliliters to liters and then liters to moles. So one liter was a point 1104.1104 moles of NaOH. And I'm going to erase this. Give me a little more space like that. I didn't think I was going to like this being able to write with my finger. I think I like it. 24.95 divided by 1,000 times 0 0.1104. And we get four significant digits. So. 0.002754 moles of NaCl. Now, guys, some of you right now are going, wait a minute, when we learned this last year, we learned that this is an intermediate calculation and we should carry an extra significant digit. Do you remember that? 
We're not gonna get all caught up with that right now, guys, and I'll talk significant digits on the AP test with you later. Technically, we should, but they don't expect it on the AP test. So if you don't carry that extra significant digit, you're okay. Rebecca, is that where your head was going? So if you wanna add it, technically you're correct and that digit would be another four. No, it's not, it would be a five. So you'd have 0 0.0027545, but we're okay. Then we bring this down and 0 0.00, Mine rounds down. I have point zero zero two seven five four four. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. If we added that additional digit, it would be up. Okay, and that is moles of NaOH. And now, guys, what we want to know is this. Well, and maybe we should contextualize this. Let's talk about it. You guys can understand this. So, what did this first calculation tell us? Well, guys, this is what the first calculation told us. We now know that we added 0 .00, what was it, 27? 2754 moles of NaOH. So when we dumped this into here, what we actually did is we dispensed 0 .002754 moles of NaOH into the acid. That's how much acid it took to neutralize, I'm sorry, that's how much base it took to neutralize the acid. Does that make sense? Okay. Now the next calculation is this. If it took this much base to neutralize the acid, how much acid must have been in the beaker? Let's talk about it. How much acid must have been in the beaker? The same number of moles. Why the same number of moles? Because the equation balances with all ones. Do you get it? So guys, if we go over here and if we look at the balanced equation, if we go here and if we go here, and guys, if we look at the balanced equation, we find out that this balances with all ones. And what that means is if there's this many moles of base that we added, there had to be that many moles of acid in the beaker because it balances with all ones. The way that we represent that mathematically is one mole of NaOH reacts with one mole of HCl. That's from the balanced equation. So this number, 2754 moles, is the same. So it turns out there were the same number of moles of acid in the beaker as it took base to neutralize the acid. Now guys, we've got one last calculation. Molarity is equal to moles divided by liters. The number of moles is 0 0.002754 moles of HCl. So now let's talk. Jumping back over to our picture, I think I can, now let's just do this. Jumping back over to our picture, guys, where is the point zero, where was the point zero zero two seven five four moles of HCl? Where is that in this picture? Where was it? In the beaker. But guys, you may remember that when we added that to the beaker, we put it in a graduated cylinder first and we measured its volume. So how big of a volume contained the 0 0.002754 moles of HCl? Do you remember? It's in your notes. 25 milliliters. So guys, this was 25 milliliters. So how big was the 0 0.002754 moles of HCl? It was 25 milliliters. So what we can do then is we can leverage that right here and we can divide this by 25 milliliters. But 25 milliliters is 0 0.025 liters. 25 divided by 1,000. Now we can do this math, divide that and the concentration of the acid to four significant, no, well that, should we count that as two? Yeah, it's perfect in the computer, but it won't be in lab, let's count it as two. So 0.11 moles, or molar HCl. 
Now, guys, if we come over here and look, I think we're going to be close. So we're claiming that the acid is 0.11 molar. And if we look over here at the acid, it turns out that it's 0.10 molar. But you'll notice, guys, that my answer is too big, right? I got 0.11. It's actually 0.103. Why would my answer be too big? Because I added too much base to the acid, right? It turned way redder than it should have because I over titrated it. And therefore, my concentration, my calculated concentration was too large. But that makes sense given the error I made, right? Okay. All right, guys. So here's the scoop. When you get into this stuff for homework, you're going to find out that the homework is going to throw all sorts of interesting little twists at you. For me to try to cover all those twists would be crazy. So I'm going to let you play with them in homework. Here's your homework. But guys, we're not done. But I'll let you write this down and then it's going to go away and then we're going to talk. All right, y'all done? Okay. So guys, this is the conversation that we're then going to have to wrap up the day. All right, so it goes like this. So actually a couple things to talk about. First of all, the test that you have on Thursday. Um, what's it gonna look like? So guys, if this is an AP class, and if our end game is to get you ready for the AP test, it makes sense that the tests that you take in this class would look like the AP test. So with that said, guys, this test will be just like the AP test. It will be multiple choice and then it will be free response. So it will be both. The multiple choice questions are off of unreleased AP question test banks. These are questions, multiple choice, these are questions that did not make the cut to be released on an AP test, but it doesn't mean they're bad. They just didn't make the cut. And then guys, the free response questions are right off of old AP tests, okay? So guys, with that said, let me explain to you the way Thursday is going to go down. And this is gonna be wildly uncomfortable for you. Okay, first of all this, we are not going to grade homework on Thursday. You have homework that you need this, right? You have homework to do between now and Thursday, but we are not going to grade it on Thursday. So if you have questions over the homework, you will come and ask those questions outside of class. So when you get in here on Thursday, um, you know you're in here second period, and, and so at, at the end of lab section on second period, I'm gonna have you clear your desks. And then we are going to distribute the test. And when the bell rings, we're gonna talk for a couple minutes and then it's gonna be go time on the test. Now guys, here's the deal. You get third period to take the test, but that's it. When the bell rings, you are done even if you're not finished. Do you understand? So guys, why am I doing this? And the reason is because when you take the AP test in May, there are time restraints on the test. Because you've got to learn to not only work well, but work quickly. And so right from the start, I write the test so that they fit within a class period of time. And that's why we're not grading homework. I want you to have that time, but we're not going to bleed over. So when the class is done, we're done even if you're not finished. Okay, so we'll talk about, and that's actually what we'll talk about before class on, on, before you take the test is pacing for the test. And all of the tests that we take in here will be timed and they'll be, they'll be administered as if they're an AP test. So it's, it's sort of that environment. Is there someone out here? Do you hear that? Am I losing my mind? Okay. So guys, with that said, it's now time to finish up the conversation that we started the very first day of school and didn't get done with. Okay, so let's just say this right now. 
most of you are not going, well, let me say it differently. For most of you, the grade that you get on this, this test that we're gonna take on Thursday will be the worst test score you've ever gotten your whole life. Let's just say that right now. So guys, when I hand these tests back to you next week, we'll have a big group hug, we'll bring in a therapist, we'll all lay down on the couch, and we'll get over all the suicidal thoughts that we're experiencing as we're thinking about dropping the class and never getting into BYU, and my life is over, and oh, I'm a horrible person, and I guess I really am as stupid as I thought I was. And, and we're just gonna have all of those thoughts, and we're gonna get them out on the table, and then we're going to realize that that number is not a measure of your ability to do chemistry. It is not a measure of your self-worth. It is not a measure of your ability to get into a good college. It is not a measure of whether or not you're going to have friends or mates or children or whatever else. It's a stinking number. And then we're going to move past this and we're going to talk about what that number means. So guys, we're going to start this conversation right now. So guys, you all understand you are not shooting for 90% on the AP test. Do you all understand that? You're clear on that, right? You don't get 90% on the AP test. And I know that some of your AP teachers will share with you these numbers, and they're like, 50% is a four. I don't want to call them out. But guys, that's not true year to year. We can talk generalizations, but the grade distributions on the AP test change every year. But I will tell you right now, if you get a 60% on the AP chem test in May, you pass the test. You're shooting for a good solid D. And anything better than that is just icing on the cake. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because here's the problem. A D on the AP test is money. A D towards your GPA, for many of you, is don't even come home that night, right? Okay. So guys, this then is the conversation. Here's how this conversation goes, and I'm going to start from scratch. The y-axis, number of students from none to all of you. Now guys, on the x-axis, GPA, four, three, two, one, and zero. And guys, if I looked up your GPAs, and if I were to cast the number of you that have fours and threes and you know, the divisions in between, guys, what would this graph look like? This. That is your grade distribution relative to your GPAs in this school. You want to know why? Because you guys are bright and grade inflation is a very real thing. So you guys understand this, right? The, 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 what used to be a C meant average, now A is average and anything less than that is your parents making phone calls. Let's just call it what it is. For those, For those of you that don't have parents that make those phone calls, calls thank, them thank them later because they're teaching you to be self-sufficient. But, but that's, a that's a different conversation. conversation. But guys, guys here's, here's the deal. It's, it's not, not just, just your parents and it's not just grade inflation. It really is that you, that you, you all, all are the best and brightest right students student in this in school. school. Now, here's, now here's the thing. If this is GPA, who is your GPA? Who is your GPA? Who is your GPA? Everybody in the school, school, when you get your class rank, is your position against all the other seniors, seniors however that is. That is. So guys, the guys, the GPA is a comparison of you versus everyone in the school. In the school. And when, when we when talk about that playground, playground, this is this where we're at. Let's just call it what it is. Okay. Okay. Now let's do this. Let's use this same chart, only now, let's talk about AP scores. If we were to take your AP scores and then cast the number of students that get those scores versus your score, and you understand three and above is passing, right? And again, I know I said this before, but guys, this graph 
actually doesn't look like this. Do you know what that's called? It's called a, a normal distribution, right? And this is actually what, if you were to take all 100,000 students, that's how many, if you took all 100,000 students that took the AP Chem test, the distribution is normal. But guys, understand, and I know I said this before, because you're in my class, it actually looks like this. The distribution is not normal because I'm good at what I do. You will do well on this test. But now, guys, here's the problem. Notice where these line up. Threes on the test are Ds in terms of GPA. So now we've got a problem, and how do we deal with this? Well, guys, let's talk about both sides of the problem. So imagine if when I graded your test, like the test you're going to take Thursday, imagine if when I graded this test, I was like, gosh, you know what? Man, gosh, Mark, he doesn't really seem to understand this material. But, but compared to everybody else in the school, man, he's really bright. So maybe I just need to make Mark feel good about himself and I need to come up and you know what, gosh, Mark's a great kid and he's doing really great in his other classes and you know, and, and I'm just going to give Mark the A on the test. Just And I just picked Mark because I saw his face. You know, I'm just going to give him the A because you know what, he's an A student and that's his GPA and he's doing really well and most of the people in the school don't even try to take AP chemistry. So the fact that he's even here makes him an A student and I'm just going to give him the A. What does that do for Mark next week? Makes him feel really good, right? But what does that do for Mark in May? Sets him up for failure. Because guys, if I'm just blowing sunshine your way and if I'm just telling you how bright you are, which wouldn't be inappropriate compared to everybody else wandering the halls of this school, guys, I can, I can sing your praises all day long. And then when you get in that bigger pond, which is the 100,000 people that take the AP test, you're going to hate my guts. Because you're going to come back and you're going to go, Knappenberger told me I knew what I was doing and clearly I don't and I got a one on the test. He deceived me. You see what I'm saying? So now look at the other side of the coin. Imagine if I went the other route and I said, all right, Mark's getting ready for the AP test and I'm going to score this test. And Mark has no idea what a net ionic equation is. That's wrong. And what the heck? That's not precipitation. And didn't he understand strong and weak electrolytes? And I just tear this test apart and da-da-da-da-da. And I hand it back to him and he's got a 40% and I throw that in his grade. What's Mark's grade in this class now? It's an F, right? Do you see how that's not fair either? I gave Mark very realistic feedback relative to when his AP test gets scored, but if I put that score in the grade book, all of a sudden Mark, who compared to everybody else in the school is really bright, he's failing a class. And guys, remember, GPA is a comparison of you and everybody else in the school. And compared to everybody else in the school, Mark's not a failing student. But compared to this material, compared to the whole country, he doesn't know it yet. So how do I walk both those lines? How do I give you legitimate feedback because you need it and yet respect relative to your grade and GPA in this class that regardless of how you do in here, you guys are still the brighter people in the school? How do I take care of that? Good question, right? Here's what I do. Guys, when you take this test on Thursday, I will sit down and I will score it. I will not grade it. And you need to understand the difference. It's, it's, it's heartless. Guys, I sit down with the AP rubric, and you got to understand on the AP test, you are guilty until proven innocent. So here's how the test gets graded. I look for the answer. If it's not there, I stop grading and you get zero on that question. If the answer is there, then I grade the rest of your work. And understand, guys, that if there is not support for your answer, I will give you some partial credit. Understand on the AP test, there is no partial credit. Each question is worth one point, and either you get it right with support or you don't. And if either one of those is missing, you get zero on that. I will give you some partial credit. But guys, understand I will not circle your mistakes. I will not write down, you forgot to think about this. I will not give you any feedback. I will give you a score. 
It's very sterile and it's very heartless. And so when you sit down and you get your test back next week, there's going to be a score at the top out of 100. And then every question on the test will have a score with, ooh, without any other feedback. And guys, that's what you're going to get. But here's the thing. That score will never go in the grade book. Why not? What is that score comparing you to? The red or the blue? The red. Guys, that score is comparing you to the AP standards that you'll be held accountable for at the end of the year. And you're not shooting for a 90% when you sit down to the AP test, but that feedback will be relative to how an AP grader would grade your test. Now, what if I took that score and put it in your grade? That's not fair, is it? So guys, here's the deal. When you get this test back, regardless of what the score is, it will not be in the grade book. I have no record of what you got. So if you lose that test, you get a zero because I don't know what you got. Then guys, what's going to happen is you will go back and you will redo from scratch. You will redo every question that you missed any points on. Multiple choice, free response, doesn't matter. You will redo every question that you missed any points on. I will give you two thirds of those points back. We will add that to your first score and that's what goes in the grade book. Do you see how that allows me to be red and blue at the same time? See, the first pass allows me to give you the legitimate feedback that you need, but it never touches your grade. It never touches blue. Then, by being the bright, resourceful students that you guys all are, you can then rewrite the test, earn back two-thirds of those points. That's what goes in your grade, which I would suggest is more reflective of where you sit relative to everybody else at Orem High. Does that make sense? And guys, along the way, you learn a lot because guess what happens when you correct your mistakes? You figure out what you didn't know the first time. So guys, that's how we're going to take care of the test. Fair? Makes a lot of sense, right? So guys, let me stop.